Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, good afternoon, everyone. We want to welcome you to this webinar hosted by the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future. I'd first like to welcome our presenters today, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to cover. Eleanor Starmer is a senior advisor to Secretary Tom Vilsack at the USDA, where she coordinates the department's efforts related to local and regional food systems and small and mid-sized farms. She also heads up the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative. Prior to joining USDA in 2011, Eleanor worked on U.S. agriculture, food, and rural development issues in the nonprofit sector for over a decade and served as a consultant to the Organization of American States Agriculture Arm, the Inter-American Institute for Agricultural Cooperation in El Salvador. Kate Fitzgerald works on policy that links family farms with consumers to achieve better public health and economic opportunity. Based in Austin, Texas for 25 years, she now works in Washington, D.C., helping nonprofit groups inform and government implement national food and farm policy. And Mark Winnie has 40 years of community food system experience, which includes 25 years of working with local and state food policy and food policy, in food policy councils. For the past seven years, he has provided training and technical assistance to over 100 communities, states, and tribes who are doing or are interested in doing food policy work. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. I will provide an overview of the Center for a Livable Future and specifically our Food Policy Networks project. Then our presenters will each talk for about 12 minutes. At the end of their talk, we will open it up for questions. You are welcome to write questions into the question bar on the right side at any time during the webinar. So to begin, the Center for a Livable Future is an interdisciplinary research center located at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our work focuses on the intersection of diet, the environment, food production, and public health. Our education program includes a food system certificate, food systems coursework, curriculum development, and support of doctoral fellowships. We conduct research and um, support other faculty members' research and collaborate with other research institutions. We also have a specific project called the Food Policy Networks Project. And this mission is to support efforts that can reform local, state, regional, and tribal food systems through effective public policy. The goal of the, this specific webinar falls under the Food Policy Networks mission. And if you look, we can, you can see some of the highlights from our project so far. We have the Food Policy Networks listserv, which has over 930 subscribers at this point. Um, on our website, if you go to www.foodpolicynetworks, which is plural, .org. Um, you can find our Food Policy Council directory, an online database of Food Policy Councils throughout North America at the different local, state, regional, and tribal nation um, levels. We also have a resource database, which includes a variety of resources that councils might find useful in writing, drafting, promoting policies, as well as different types of um, intercommunications between their councils, and we conduct quarterly communication and outreach activities such as this webinar series. We also provide training and technical assistance, um, and you can view that on our website as well. It, we have the Chesapeake Food Policy Leadership Institute is our primary one, and we also conduct workshops at different conferences throughout the country. Next, I'm going to open it up to Eleanor to begin the, the presentation. Thank you so much, Rachel, and thanks for everyone who's joining us from around the country today. It's great to have this opportunity to talk with you. So as Rachel mentioned, my name is Eleanor Starmer, and I work here at the U.S. Department of Agriculture as a senior advisor to Secretary Tom Vilsack. I've been here since 2011, and um, I work mainly on local and regional food systems and efforts to ensure that USDA programs can serve the needs of folks who are engaged in local food work and um, the farms that are supplying local food food markets. My background, is, as Rachel mentioned, is actually in the nonprofit sector. And so when I came into USDA, it was the first time that I'd been working in government. And I was both um, very struck by the opportunities that there were, were, were to work here and to do this kind of work within USDA, 
and also struck by um, how rarely people call me to, to talk to me about um, how the programs are working in, in their communities and um, to share their visions for what they'd like to see. So there are some wonderful groups doing this work at the, at the national level, um, and there's some incredible work taking place locally, um, but I think there's a lot more that we can do to strengthen that relationship between um, folks in, in the local communities who are really implementing these programs and then the groups at the national level and USDA. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like, and Rachel, if you can take us to the next slide. Um, what I'll cover today, and, and these are themes that you're going to hear throughout the three presentations today, um, how, I, I phrase it, how do you open the black box? And I mention that because, um, or I characterize it that way because I think a lot of people see USDA as as a black box, um, not a lot of clarity on what we do and how to engage with us. And there is some belief um, that you know local food policy and other policies that we want to see around healthy food access um, and other goals, it kind of ends when a bill gets passed in the legislature. Um, that's absolutely not the case. There are a ton of opportunities to engage once um, legislation moves over to USDA to be implemented. So I'm going to be talking about some of the ways that that can happen, and our other two speakers will be um, putting more meat on these bones. So I'll talk about the importance of education, um, some ways to develop relationships with the department, um, opportunities to pilot and innovate things at the local level that can be replicated at the national level and influence the way that we do our work here. Um, I'll talk about some opportunities to engage on implementation, and then I'll encourage folks to just keep doing it, do it over and over again, build up the capacity to really do this work. And at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about some um, resources that you all can use to, uh, to increase uh, your capacity and your understanding of USDA. Next slide, Rachel. So that brings me to this, this graphic, which I think is probably from a uh, government textbook from 1974, but luckily things are ageless on the internet. Um, the reason that I wanted to highlight it here, and you can kind of ignore the whole thing except this, this bar at the bottom where it says policy modification phase. Um, so I just wanted to note that this is, a, I like this graphic because it highlights the fact that you've got policy formulation um, and that really happens on the Hill, and then you have the implementation phase that happens in the agencies like USDA. But then there's this policy modification phase, which is input that's coming from the local level about how policies are impacting them and how those policies are working. And that, um, that, that information is communicated back both to the folks in the legislative arena um, on the Hill and in your local offices, and then also back to USDA. And that really imp influences the way that policy um, uh, evolves from that point. I'll also mention that um, all of the uh, activities that folks might engage in in terms of interacting with USDA around our programs is acceptable for a 501c3 organization to do. So any interactions that you're having with, in that implementation phase um, is not considered lobbying. And so if you are a C3, um, established as a, C, as a C3, all of what I'm about to tell you is fair game. I think is an important point. But at USDA, we are really committed to this dialogue because the programs that we run, we are the largest funder by far um, of local food systems work nationally. Since 2009, we've done about $800 million worth of funding for local food systems projects. Um, but that, and so that sounds like a huge number and it's, it's fairly intimidating, but that is all experienced very much at the local level. And so if we don't understand how it's impacting you and how um, those programs are playing out, we can't improve the way the programs work. So that communication is very important. All right, next slide. So, and you, Rachel, you can just click through to, yep, that's one more, I think. There you go. Um, so how, where do you start in terms of engaging? The most important, um, uh, starting point is to begin to understand the process. Um, and that's really looking at what are your priorities as a Food Policy Council and how can USDA help. And I'm going to be mentioning some resources at the end of this discussion that um, can point you in the right direction. And then understanding who at USDA might be running the programs that are of interest to you. We have 17 different agencies here at the department. Um, they operate at different levels. Some of them um, have representation locally and some don't. We'll talk about that more in a second. Um, and so you're really needing to figure out, here are my priorities, here are some um, resources or programs that I might be able to utilize, and then here's the structure of the agencies that are running those programs and, and figuring out how to engage that way. 
Um, it's also really important as you're looking at programs to think about things like what, what programs do we have that might require a match? And is there a, a role that food policy councils can play in terms of helping be that matchmaker um, and leveraging some local resources as well? Um, who else in your area is getting and leveraging federal funding? And what can you learn from engaging with them and talking to them about um, what they're doing with, that, with that, those resources? So that's kind of learning the who, what, and how of the programs. Understanding the timeline is very important. Um, we have timeline for implementation of programs. Um, grants will have, you know, each grant will probably have its own timeline in terms of when applications open and when awards are made. So it's important to understand those things. Um, and I put here, but don't be too patient because it's an important note even if the policy isn't quite where you want it to be, there may be some opportunities to engage with us um, and um, do some pilot work or um, other activities that you know, may not initially seem like they're sanctioned. Um, so I'll talk about that again in a second, but just did want to highlight those. Don't, don't, don't feel that you're absolutely tied to the timeline. Um, discussions are really important. Build capacity through experience and training. This is really learning from just diving in and trying to engage. Um, and this is something that food policy councils are very well positioned to do, um, to, to try out uh, how to work with your local USDA representatives um, and how to communicate with them about um, what's happening with the programs. And then taking some time to debrief and assess both how the programs are working for your community as well as how your engagement is going and whether there's um, things that can be learned from past experience. And communicating those successes and the things that aren't working is really, really important. Next slide. So building relationships with USDA, there are a lot of different avenues to do this. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention is that there are um, two different types of employees at USDA. There are uh, political appointees who are part of the administration, and then there are career employees who are going to be here regardless of who is in office um, in the presidency. Um, regard you're going to engage with those two folks in slightly different ways. Um, because the political appointees are part of the administration, if what you're working on aligns well with an administration priority, those may be good first points of contact for you. Um, but the career employees are the ones who are actually implementing the programs, and um, those relationships are going to be really, really critical ongoing relationships for you to have as you see how programs are, are playing out at the local level. Um, as I mentioned, our, we have 17 different agencies, and each one is structured slightly differently, which I know is a little confusing, but it's, 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 uh, once you get a handle on it, it's, it makes a lot of sense. Um, several of our offices have, um, or our agencies, have offices in almost every county in the U.S. And those are mainly going to be the offices that serve farmers directly. So our Farm Service Agency and our Natural Resources Conservation Service are two examples. Um, our Rural Development Agency, which does a lot of um, some local food funding and also some other funding for rural communities, is also present in, in most counties. And those offices, um, those agencies also have uh, offices at the state level. There are some agencies that have regional offices. Um, a good one that many of you all may work with is the Food and Nutrition Service. Um, so those are based regionally. I do want to mention that our Food and Nutrition Service offices have uh, now a full-time point of contact in every regional office focused exclusively on farm to school opportunities. So that's uh, pretty cool. Um, and in those regional offices, they um, have uh, the ability to work with uh, any folks anywhere in the states that that region covers. You're going to have a lot of state implementation partners. So depending on the program that you're talking about, um, for example, if you are trying to leverage a specialty crop block grant, this is funding that often supports local food systems work, um, but it's run through the State Departments of Agriculture. So USDA gives funding to the states, and the states then implement the program. Um, another good example is if you are um, engaged with some of our food nutrition programs, then you're probably working with local partner agencies. Um, so, so it's important to understand who those partners are. National office staff, um, some of our agencies have representatives just at the national level, and some of the local programs um, have national office staff that are worth engaging with if you're trying to understand how things are being done in other parts of the country, uh, if you want that national perspective, or if the program is being run through the national, the national level. Um, I put in traveling USDA leadership just because I think it's a good opportunity to engage. You'll often have folks coming through some of our principals, um, and there may be events that you can attend um, or sit in on or support yourselves. 
they often like to go visit projects that we have funded, and I think that's a very good opportunity to start building that relationship too. So it's something to keep an eye on. And then other federal partners. Um, I've been really interested to learn how much other partners, other folks in the federal government besides USDA um, are working on local food systems, whether it's housing and urban development, um, uh, EPA has a phenomenal brownfields program that's really active in the local food space, Department of Transportation. There's a lot of options there, so it's important also to look outside at just USDA. Next slide. So, and you can, yep, one more. Okay, Oops, go back. There we go. Um, so I wanted to put in a slide specifically on, on the importance of the role that food policy councils can play regarding piloting really innovative ideas, testing out policy concepts at the local level, and then evaluating them can really feed into policy making at the national level. Um, and one good example, which Kate Fitzgerald can talk at great length about, I'm sure, but I'll, I'll start off, is the Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentives Program, which is a new program coming out of the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, this is, many of you know it as double up food bucks um, or double value coupons that folks can use at the farmer's market if they're purchasing um, fruits and vegetables using SNAP. This started with local organizations. That, that recognized this as a big need to try to thread the needle between farmers needing to um, make a fair living and uh, low-income consumers who really wanted and needed access to those healthy foods at the farmer's market. And so they started piloting this incentive idea. Um, that required getting a waiver from our Food and Nutrition Service to be able to provide the incentives. And I think that's a really key point, um, that sometimes something that may seem like it's not allowable um, if it meets important policy goals, then, then it's worth having that conversation. So they did that and they received that waiver. Um, they were also partnering with us at this, because at that time, as this was being tried out, we were really emphasizing um, making sure that all farmers markets had access to an EBT machine to be able to process SNAP and other nutrition incentives. So those things kind of worked hand in hand. But they were able to not just try out the policy idea, but also do some really robust evaluation. And the result was that um, the, the evaluation was very strong. There was some very good work that took place on the legislative side, and we're now looking at 100 million dollar program in the farm bill that will be leveraged with a two to one match from philanthropy. So this is a really great example of how that local and national partnership can work. Next slide. Engaging on implementation. This is really um, rulemaking. And um, Rachel, if you can click a couple more. I'm going to give, that's, that's it, that's great. I'm going to give um, a couple examples of moments where uh, food policy councils can engage in the rulemaking process. Um, the rulemaking process is really where USDA writes out how a program is going to be implemented. So a good example of the um, authority that we have as we do this rulemaking is the Farm to School program. Um, this was created through the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act in 2010, and when it was created in that piece of legislation, it was about three paragraphs long. Our rule for Farm to School, the implementation guidelines for how we're actually going to run the program, is 45 pages long. So there is a ton of information that we need to be putting in there in terms of who's eligible for the program, the types of activities that can be carried out, and a lot of that is up to our discretion. So that's why it's really important to engage in this process because it very, very much impacts how the program is actually able to be used at the local level. So a couple moments you can engage in this. One is just after the legislation is passed. Um, if you come in to talk to us about or communicate with your local offices about um, a piece of legislation that's just passed, most likely the response you'll get will be, thank you for that information, we'll take it uh, into consideration, because we don't know yet um, what it's going to look like. But the information that you provide then and the perspective is very, very important in shaping how we think about the rule. Another opportunity for engagement is during a public comment period. So we will put out a proposed rule, and there will be an opportunity to comment on it. Um, and and that's, that's, again, a very good opportunity um, to plug in. And then once a rule goes into effect, there's some very good um, in, communication that needs to take place because if something's not working, there are opportunities for us to go back and fix it. And so just because a rule has been finalized doesn't mean it has to be that way forever. Um, I did want to give one really quick example of really good engagement around rulemaking, and that's with the Food Safety Modernization Act. I'm sure many of you are aware of this. Um, FDA is finalizing the rules for FSMA right now. They came out with 
proposed rules at the end of last year, and there were a lot of concerns that especially the small farm community, um, but also other parts of agriculture had about the rule. And um, that communication was so effective that FDA actually went back and did something they almost never do, which is they put out a second proposed rule and did a second comment period. Um, and that is really testament to the, the good organizing and communication that took place around that. And I think as a result, I hope, I have not seen the final, but um, I hope that it will be greatly improved um, beyond what it, what it was originally proposed to do. Uh, next slide, please. So the other opportunity to engage on implementation is when a program is actually being rolled out. Um, so we have, once a rule is finalized um, and we've got programs that are operating on an ongoing basis, um, and moments where you all can engage are looking at how the program is actually performing. Is it meeting the needs of your community? If not, why not? Um, evaluating that and communicating that to us is really important all along the way. Um, partnering with USDA on outreach and program participation. So there may be um, some opportunities if we're trying to target a priority area or a priority demographic, like on the underserved producers or low-income communities. We really rely on partnerships with local level groups to get the word out about those programs. So that's another opportunity to participate. Um, talking to us about new needs and priorities as they come up. This is really key, and this is where food policy councils can be a vehicle to communicate some of those needs um, to the national level. A good example is when farmers markets, um, when food stamps became electronic, um, farmers markets were unable to accept electronic SNAP. And that need was very clearly communicated to us, and we were able to work really quickly and um, tee up two of our agencies to both clarify that FNS could, or clarify that farmers markets could accept electronic um, benefits, and also make sure that we were able to support wireless EBT terminals for markets through our, one of our grant programs. That would never have happened if folks hadn't communicated with us that it was a problem. Um, so that is, is a really critical role as well that you all can help play. And then educating others to um, help them engage. Um, I'm actually doing a call in two hours this afternoon um, with farmers to talk about the importance of having local food producers engaged in our county committees through Farm Service Agency. Um, and uh, without going into all the details, I'll just say that there's lots of ways that we can partner with you all to reach some of those producers or businesses um, to help them understand what the opportunities are to, to plug in with USDA. Next slide. Okay, um, to close, I wanted to quickly highlight two resources that I think will be helpful for you. One is through our Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative, which I coordinate. We have a great website that is really kind of a one-stop shop for folks who are interested in understanding how USDA is supporting local food uh, producers and businesses and communities. Um, the top photo here on the left is just the homepage of our website. Um, it has some a very good grants and loans page that's kind of a rundown of about 30 different grant and loan programs and how they can be used to support local food. Um, we've also got a bunch of other um, resources on that site. And then we have something called the Compass. Um, and if you can flip to the next slide, Rachel. This is a map that we just relaunched actually on Friday. Um, that takes those 30 grant and loan programs that I mentioned and maps USDA investments in local food projects around the country through those programs. In addition to that uh, information, we've got what we call context data, other data that we gather, for example, farmers markets, the locations of food hubs, the locations of meat processing facilities, all of that's mapped. And we also included data from about uh, nine other federal departments. So you can learn a little bit more about the types of other federal programs that can support local food. This is an incredible resource for you to hone in on your own community and see who's utilizing federal programs for local food work. If you're interested in um, looking for funding to do a certain type of project, you can search the map by keyword and you can see folks in other parts of the country who are utilizing federal programs and how they're doing that. Um, you can reach out to people in your own community who've gotten those funds and you know, bring them to meetings, um, learn from them about how they're leveraging that money and the types of resources that may be creating for your community. So there's a lot of opportunities here, and I wanted to make sure that, that you were all aware of it, and the website is down there at the bottom of this slide. So Rachel, last slide. 
this is my information. I would love to keep in touch and we can certainly answer questions at the end, but I will um, leave it here for now and pass it off to Kate Fitzgerald to, uh, to pick up on her section of the presentation. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Eleanor. I appreciate it. And hello, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us today. Um, I will take slightly less time since Eleanor has given you an overview, of which I hope is comprehensive and not overwhelming, um, and use my time to encourage you really to think about the various kinds of skills and capacities within your Food Policy Council and and use them and really uh, take up the, the challenge that um, Eleanor has thrown down to engage. This government is yours and they really do want to hear from you. Um, second slide, please. I can't, one can't state or overstate how much the quality of policy passed both by Congress and implemented by federal agencies is affected by how much and what they hear from constituents. I am a, a lobbyist and it is absolutely true that when a constituent goes to meet with the office of a senator or a member of Congress, the respect and the hearing that they get as voting members of the public is much, much greater than the attention I get, even though I may be an expert on certain work, but because I'm not, a, uh, I am a citizen, but I'm not a voting citizen of their particular community. So please, never underestimate the power that you have to influence decisions that are made here. The other thing that I think can be intimidating is this whole notion of lobbying and the concern that people have that it may not be legal if, for example, they are government employees at a local, state, county level or work for a nonprofit organization. And emphasize the, a point that Eleanor made early on, which is that lobbying is refers to very distinct activities asking for specific votes on specific pieces of information, sharing information, explaining to members of Congress or federal agencies the various kinds of programs or projects you have in your community are not lobbying, are completely legitimate, and are super important ways to help get the policy that comes out of this city to serve your needs. As members of Food Policy Councils, I think you're also really well qualified to provide information that will be noticed here in DC. This, um, I did also want to mention that in this webinar we're going to concentrate specifically on the kinds of policy and programs that are available for regional food systems. We understand that USDA and the Farm Bill cover a really enormous swath of kinds of federal policy and some of it is both complicated and involved in the structure of agriculture and international trade. And in the interest of simplicity, we're going to not include that and just concentrate on programs that food policy councils could apply in their communities today. Next slide. So the question is why, as members of food policy councils, can you be particularly helpful to members of Congress and to federal agencies? The first is the pretty obvious one. You are the people that live in your state or county or city and know how the programs that are designed here actually work or don't work on the ground. That kind of feedback is critically important to improve policy in the long run. And second of all, we talk a lot here and bemoan how very separated the different government agencies are. There have been a lot of efforts made to try to break out of what we commonly refer to as silos, but I think we have to think of a, of a newer and better term for that. But what's beautiful about the policy councils is usually they include people who know public health people who know transportation, people who are, understand how bus systems work in their communities. So the fact that you have together meeting regularly, 
representatives with different sectors and different perspectives immediately puts you a step ahead of most of the policymakers here and provides a kind of model that we can emulate. Related to that, but a point that I think deserves real emphasis is because you are working at a level closer to the way people actually use these programs in their daily lives, you are probably the best situated people to offer solutions to the challenges or barriers that inadvertently have emerged from policy paths here. So concentrating on solutions and the ability to offer solutions that will be practical in your areas is an enormous asset. And finally, because you do represent the communities in which you live, your input and opinion is given added credence. You are trusted messengers. You're not just being paid by some particular entity or company to present that particular point of view. So essentially, you guys have the knowledge, the experience, the connections, and the authenticity to be particularly helpful at creating better policy. Next slide. The other thing is, this is again getting back to the question of what is lobbying or what isn't lobbying, but also the question of interacting with government or legislators being intimidating. And I think it's really important to try to overcome the notion that policy is something that is different, that is the realm of specialists, and that is somehow separated from the everyday work of doing programs to make people's lives work better. Everything that you all do every day is related in some way to policy. And I think that you should be proud of that. It's super important. It's why communities work. And sharing the information with the legislators and the civil servants that work for the government agencies that serve us is an enormously important and helpful part of what you can do. So when you do things, please let people know. Next slide. I want to have brought up the, I, well, a whole bunch of really important ways in which one can intervene or help guide, improve, inform policy. And I think it's helpful to break it down a little bit and realize that not everybody has to know or do everything, which can be absolutely overwhelming the idea. There are very specific kinds of categories of work that food policy councils take on and very specific processes that happen in the federal government. And it makes sense to assign responsibilities within your food policy council to people that have particular kinds of experience or an affinity for particular kinds of work. One person who is really interested in legislation, for example, can be charged with watching the pieces of legislation that will have an impact on the community and letting the rest of the group know about them when they're important points. If there are people that really think that rules are fascinating, by all means, let them concentrate on that. The same goes for the other kinds of work that food policy councils have to engage in to stay germane. I think the basic point is what can seem overwhelming is not so overwhelming when you're not trying to do it all yourself or having just a couple of people in the group try to do everything. Another thing is that there are really significant, excellent national advocacy groups, professional associations, and other organizations that are either based in D.C. or work in D.C. frequently and have both experience and tools that you can use so that each policy council member doesn't have to become proficient in all of the various kinds of programs on which you might want to interact. And finally, the point that Eleanor made, I would just reinforce that relationships really are important. Just as it's important that you tell people what it is that you're doing, explaining to them 
in a way that they will be able to hear, being sure that you thank both federal agencies or public agencies and elected officials when they do smart things or make the right moves, asking how you can help all of those uh, kinds of approaches which are solution-based rather than perhaps criticism-based, which might be the immediate reaction, are more likely to be successful in the long run. So finally, a particular action item that you guys could be involved in now that I hope is not too complicated and for which there are pretty clear-cut and easy actions that can be taken. Eleanor talked about the notion that it makes sense to connect low-income consumers that receive SNAP benefits with small and mid-sized farmers who are growing fruits and vegetables and marketing them locally. As you all may know, there has been a challenge since the food stamp program transferred to electronic benefit technology because many farmers market the farm stands simply aren't equipped with the machines or internet service to accept those. There's a check next to the word legislation here because the Farm Bill actually provides for farmers markets and farm direct marketers not having to pay for this equipment. We're now at the implementation stage. It's up to the USDA Food and Nutrition Service and each state SNAP agency to decide exactly what that one sentence in the Farm Bill means. The recommendation that I would make to you is that perhaps the solution to this, to make it as easy as possible for SNAP shoppers, for farmers markets, and for the state departments of social service and food and nutrition service, would simply require, be to require that the companies that process the, all of the SNAP purchases for each state be asked to include that these companies are responsible also for serving farmers markets, farm stands, and any other healthy food retailer that requires wireless equipment and services. A phone call or an email to the regional FNS office or the state SNAP agency is all that that would take. Next slide. Um, the, in the interest of not having to know everything yourself, I've listed here, I guess it looks like at about 10 or 11 organizations that have expertise in particular kinds of work that food policy councils are likely to be engaged in. All of these organizations' websites can be found just by searching for their name. Um, that seems like an easier way to do it than include their actual website. Explore those websites and you'll, I think, be relieved to see that a lot of the kinds of information that you thought would be hard to find is actually at your fingertips. And finally, the last slide, that's it for me. If you have any questions on anything that I've said, um, please feel free to call or email me. My bad, there's another. Here are three more also funding resources that are super, super helpful. And then I'll finish up with the last slide, which is my contact information, and send you on to Mark. Take it away, Mark. Thank you, Kate. And I also thank you, Eleanor. Two very good presentations and a lot of excellent guidance. And um, so I think we all had a good opportunity to um, benefit from their wisdom. I'm going to take this, I guess, down to one more layer down, and which uh, we'll be on the ground for the most part looking at how uh, actual food policy councils have interacted with federal policy, um, federal regulations, uh, programs, and uh, various representatives of particularly of USDA. So um, I also wanted to just note that, uh, again, we have our CLF website for this food policy networks, plural, Dot org, which has a tremendous amount of information and services and assistance, and I'd urge you to go there. And if I'm not mistaken, we also have a, a paper coming out soon uh, from our Stories from the Field series, uh, which I know Rachel has been working on, that will uh, highlight some of the uh, good examples of Food Policy Council work uh, interacting with federal programs. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, again, um, 
we're all into relationships here, and uh, again, when it comes to working with government, relationships count, as in every other walk of life. So I'm going to underscore that as well. I'm going to be drawing examples from New Mexico, California, Connecticut, and a few other states where I've had a fair amount of experience. Um, what generally federal officials may not serve on a food policy council, they're, they're not prohibited from doing so that I know of, but generally you won't find them there. However, it's common for representatives of um, federal agencies, and in particular uh, con uh, congressional offices, to send a representative to a food policy council meeting. And I would encourage you to reach out to them if they're not already doing that, um, if they're not coming on their own, to invite them to, some, to attend meetings to send a representative and use that as an opportunity to build your relationships. Um, two places that I'm familiar with that have done that, one is with Mexico Food and Agriculture Policy Council, which is the State Food Policy Council for New Mexico, um, has done a very good job of engaging um, uh, members of the staff of our U.S. Senators and our members of Congress. San Bernardino has done that as well with their own, their member for the district that uh, serves their area. Uh, one of our Congresswomen here in New Mexico, Congresswoman Lujan Grisham, has actually, is actually in the process of sponsoring a state hunger forum or on her own, I mean, with the cooperation of a number of, of uh, private sector partners, including our Food Policy Council. So, um, you know, a good opportunity where you can see a, a member of Congress uh, going, you know, definitely the extra mile to engage in food system work. In Connecticut, the State Food Policy Council was uh, uh, played a big role in bringing USDA Undersecretary uh, Con Cannon to speak on nutrition and health care. And this was uh, brought up earlier, I believe, by Eleanor when she mentioned that uh, um, you know, USDA officials are out there all the time having hearings, uh, meeting with constituents, meeting with stakeholders, and you all should take advantage of those hearings to attend or to actually invite them to come and, and do something special in your area. Next slide. Looking at regulations and comments, um, you know, this is an area perhaps that's a little bit new for food policy councils. And I, you know, I should also note that uh, you know, food policy councils have been working on federal policy for a long, long time. There's really nothing new here. It's just that we're learning as we go. We're learning how to do it better. Um, and many people out there listening, I'm sure, have been engaged in federal policy work with uh, through different avenues, not necessarily food policy councils, maybe with different local or state uh, organizations or even national advocacy organizations. So, you know, we're all benefiting from our, our, our growing experience and our wisdom on this subject. But I think we're finding more opportunities, particularly with the, the regulatory and rulemaking process that Eleanor talked about earlier, to weigh in. And uh, the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association was one organization that actually worked with uh, local food policy councils to respond to congressional bills. Often we don't have uh, the kind of expertise at a local food policy council level that we you know, that we might uh, use in order to provide useful uh, comments. So actually having another organization which is able to engage at a say a higher level of government can be a really important asset. Um, in fact, more of our state food policy councils are really acting as a networking hub um, and bringing in those local food policy councils. And through that hub, they're facilitating the flow of information on, on actions that they can take at the local level that will have an impact on the federal level. So think about what that opportunity might look like. Think about if you have a state food policy council or any other group that could act as a networking hub for local food policy councils, that it might develop the expertise to influence federal policy and, and sift that down to train, engage, and so forth, people at the local level to weigh in. Uh, in Santa Fe, where I live and serve on the food policy council, we weighed in, for instance, on the dietary guidelines that were uh, just uh, uh, closed uh, within, the, I guess, a month or so ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, we basically supported many, many of the recommendations that were made by the, uh, by the uh, expert uh, committee. 
Um, but we also use this as an opportunity to engage our own city and county elected boards um, for them to weigh in as well. So whereas the Food Policy Council actually did the work to identify what in the guidelines we wanted to support and provided the analysis and the overall um, um, recommendation um, and comments, we went then to our respective boards and count city councils and said, hey folks, let's get on board with this. This is a, this is a good thing uh, for all the reasons that are appropriate to us living here in the Southwest. And um, as a result, they did. They did make those comments, the city and our county individually, as well as the Food Policy Council. And it gave the Food Policy Council one more opportunity for us to work closely with our own local uh, elected officials. And we communicated as well our, our recommendations to the, our state congressional delegation. Um, Kate was making the point that if something happens or you're doing something or you know something, let people know. And I think that that's you know, incredibly important advice. I tell people to communicate, communicate, and then communicate again. Keep telling people what you're doing, why things are important, and provide good, thoughtful uh, uh, information whenever you have that opportunity. Uh, West Virginia, their Food and Farm Coalition, which uh, acts to some degree as a statewide food policy council, also commented on the Food Safety Modernization Act. And, you know, again, that was mentioned before as a, as, as a, was a great opportunity for uh, community input uh, to take place. So next slide, please. So educate yourselves about federal programs. This, was, this point has been made before. Obviously, you can't use a program and the funding and everything associated with it effectively unless you know what your own need is and how that program might actually help with that need. Um, so uh, the process usually starts with you knowing your own place and knowing what the issues and problems are that you face there. But then you need to understand how those particular fo fo federal programs that are already in place and generally already operating, how do they work? And almost in every case when I've been involved in doing this, I usually find they can work better than they are. More people can be served, services can be provided in, the, in a better fashion. Um, not that anybody is being derelict necessarily in the way that services are delivered. It's simply the, it's what happens when, when constituents show an interest in a particular need in a particular program. Um, the, in Connecticut, the Food Policy Council pays particular attention to the SNAP, to SNAP and to uh, WIC, the performance, caseloads, and so forth, to make sure that we're doing everything uh, they, they can to uh, have those programs operate well and serve as many people as, as possible. Uh, they were also particularly engaged when it came to uh, EBT and farmers markets and were, were, were critical in bringing uh, EBT to the farmers markets throughout the state. In San Bernardino County and uh, California, the Food Policy Council uh, looked at their summer meal program and discovered that they were only serving 5% of the eligible population, a very low number. And through their engagement and through their knowledge of the uh, summer uh, feeding program, they were able to double it, you know, to 10%. That was uh, nine or 10,000 more children came on board in 2014 to receive uh, summer lunch than they had the year before. In fact, it turned out to be the fastest and the biggest growth rate for all the large counties throughout California. So the Food Policy Council, knowing how the program operates, and then becoming engaged itself in how to improve its performance. They also went further with uh, their schools and started to come up with ways to reduce waste in the schools uh, by as much as 20 tons just with three schools. They've also been working with a healthy food banking policy uh, that has been very successful in increasing the amount of fresh produce that's distributed through uh, food pantries, emergency food pantries. And some of this work involved them actually looking at how a food, uh, healthy food banking policy can work with uh, the uh, emergency food um, uh, assistance program and uh, the US, some of the USDA food orders that uh, uh, schools are involved with. Next slide, please. Next slide. Here we go. So just continuing on that, they also extended, no, not that 
go back one more. Yeah, the um, San Bernardino just also extended their work into some other areas, not just USDA, but started looking at how health policy uh, can interact with the Affordable Care Act. This has been a particularly productive and interesting area um, that has a huge amount of potential for food policy councils, and particularly when it comes to working with your hospitals in your region and how they can uh, be more in compliance with the ACA and um, how additional resources can ultimately flow to your community that will improve eating. Uh, Cumberland County in Maine, their Food Security Council, conducted a forum on uh, on the child nutrition reauthorization, and this is this is in the works now. And I would recommend that food policy councils, you know, use that as an opportunity to talk about the issues of of nutrition and uh, children and, and programs in the schools, um, um, and uh, I just lost my own screen. <laughs> For some reason, just give me a moment. Um, but uh, so I mean, let me, uh, Rachel. I'm afraid I lost my the slides that I was looking at for some reason. Um, I'll have to kind of go from my memory at this point. So on the next on the next slide, um. Uh, finally, on federal on uh, federal funding, um, I'm not going to go into a long list of all the programs. And Eleanor and Kate provided us with some information already, but um, um, some funding is can be very programmatic in its focus. And uh, the farmers market local food promotion grants is one example where I know food policy councils have reached out. Oh, I got it back. And have been able to use that funding to, uh, you know, to advance some of their their policy interests at the local level. Uh, and food uh, funding can also be used simply for the development of a food policy council, as they have done in uh, Kentucky and uh, upstate New York, St. Lawrence County in particular. Uh, next slide. Next, next, two more slides. Uh, looking at um, New Mexico, where I, where I say that. We're putting it all together. Um, it might be that might sound a little arrogant, but in fact, over the course of 10 years, it's very interesting to watch how this Food Policy Council has interacted with its federal partners, uh, programs, uh, elected officials, uh, how they've used the, their work at the federal level to leverage support at the state level. Uh, it takes 10 years, and I can't say it was a you know perfectly logical linear process. Uh, would often had probably looked more like a kind of an octopus with all kinds of arms flailing about. But um, you know, this is you know, they started out with uh, getting funding for the WIC and Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program. Uh, what they found they had to do was actually go to their state agencies. Uh, that was act was one of which was uh, necessary in order to. Um, um, my slides are bouncing around here, but one of which was they had to actually work with a um, uh, state agency to get them to actually apply for the senior farmers market nutrition funding. You know, and this was uh, the kind of advocacy that had to get done. Um, they've been able to connect also with the federal fresh fruit and vegetable snack program. Um, work there resulted in really it was really kind of a, a big setting the stage for later on for farm to school efforts. Uh, but it was a way to work with schools and work with federal programs at the same time, learning how the schools work, how, learning how the programs, federal program work that, that set them up for better work and for more extensive work with farm to school. Um, work banking off of the school wellness policies that were developed by an, a, a previous uh, child nutrition reauthorization uh, effort. Um, they've been able to actually minimize the amount of competitive foods, you know, the, the, a lot of the junk food that shows up in our cafeterias by, and then engaging with the state agencies at the same time to, to write rules that would restrict um, the amount of competitive food. Um, additionally, they advocated for more state support. New Mexico has provided some state support for breakfast programs. Um, next slide. 
And um, early on, another in another CNR effort, they uh, supported the, the need for geographic preference in order to promote more local procurement from farm to school, uh, which they are now doing through the, uh, uh, which was done through the Hunger Free Children's Act, and now they're working on expanding the funding uh, in the upcoming uh, child nutrition reauthorization for more farm to school efforts. And just looking at farm to school, it's been very interesting to watch how it's worked. Um, starting out a long time ago, many years ago, they used community food project grant funds to actually start farm to school in New Mexico. Um, so that was one early effort that was where they used federal funds to get farm to school off the ground. They then used some of the meal guideline changes that were were mandated um, in the uh, past CNR and used that to leverage funding for farm to school from the state, arguing that there wasn't enough money to be able to pay for some of the fresh fruits and vegetables that were now required in the new meal guidelines. And as a result, over a series of several legislative sessions, the Food Policy Council was able to secure $480,000 a year for farm to school. Um, using They used some of the same procedures and process with respect to farmers markets. Uh, the state now provides $400,000, for instance, for the, a double up bucks program. This is, I think it's the first state that's providing that kind of money uh, for their local farmers markets. And uh, fortunately, they were able to use some Finney grant funds to support that, um, you provide education and other outreach efforts to support that uh, $400,000 double up uh, buck program. And lastly, uh, I think another just another arm of USDA, in this case was rural development. Uh, the Food Policy Council worked closely with them to support uh, retail food initiatives in uh, some of the state's rural communities. Uh, this serious lack of infrastructure, USDA rural development has been very helpful in providing support, planning, research, and funding for that infrastructure. And um, also uh, extended that to an irrigation project on the on the Navajo Nation, uh, so that they could have a much more productive form of uh, agriculture. So I'm going to leave it there, uh, just to give you, an, you know, again, New Mexico provided a kind of a, I think, a good working model of how you can engage at many different levels, many different levels of government, and um, use their understanding of how federal programs work to leverage funding from the state and even to some extent from for local groups as well. So I'm going to end up there and turn it back to you, Rachel. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, so right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to field questions to the different panelists, um, so they can all, you guys can all take yourself off mute if you're still on mute. Um, we already have two questions in, so the first one, um, I think this might go best to Kate, but others, please chime in if you think um, it's appropriate for you to answer too. The question is. Is it the general consensus that even if feedback periods have officially ended, it is still worthwhile to communicate with agencies with feedback anyway? Ah, got it. I would say yes. I think it is always helpful to communicate. It is true, however, though, as, as Eleanor pointed out, when there are formal response periods, for example, for proposed rules, if, it is, if you are past the date on which that was a deadline for the response, it's possible that you will not be able to respond on the regulations.gov website. Um, so I think it's important to take those deadlines seriously. I think the point that Eleanor was making was it's not only informal rule response periods that you can interact with your federal agency. You will just have to do it differently. And it is always good to provide information, invite people to visit, and offer suggestions on how programs could be improved. So I guess that was a long-winded way of saying the deadlines are real if it's a formal response period, but don't let having missed a deadline prevent you from providing information to a federal agency in a productive way. And this is Eleanor, if I can just jump on to the, the end of that, and Kate, that was perfectly said. Um, opportunities, so yes, if it's a public 
comment period for a proposed rule, then obviously the deadlines are firm. But um, once that has passed, if a program is being implemented and you're communicating with USDA about how that program is going, there might be opportunities for us to make changes the following year to the way that our request for proposals is worded. We may be able to issue guidance um, on specific things that might be unclear within the program to clarify it. We may be able to make changes administratively to the program um, through things other than a rule that um, can make the program work better. Um, you know, a really good example of this, and this is more of a farm level example, um, we were able to, so we got a lot of feedback that um, smaller scale producers weren't necessarily using our large farm loans, which can go up to $300,000, um, and that the application process was very burdensome. And we actually, with our own existing authority, we didn't have to go to Congress, we didn't have to do anything new, we were able to pilot a microloan program for producers that's up to loans of up to $50,000, um, significantly reduced paperwork requirements, they do things like count apprenticeships as um, part of your experience in farming, so you have to have a certain number of years in farming to qualify for a loan. Now an apprenticeship counts as part of that. So there were a whole bunch of things that we were actually able to do um, completely outside of the legislative process because we had the authority to do it. And it was through communicating with folks who, were, who wanted to use our programs but for whom they weren't working that well that we found um, that this was a need. And we created the program, we launched it in the spring of 2013, and we've made over 14,000 microloans around the country, many of them to beginning farmers and local food producers um, since that point. So that's just a, one example of the, of the opportunities there. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, another one of our questions I'm just going to answer. So the question was, where does the New Mexico Food Policy Council get funding? And we actually did, um, in the last webinar series, it, the focus was on funding food policy councils. And in our accompanying resource, which you can find online, um, the New Mexico Food, policy, food and Agriculture Council actually has, it's a case study in our report. So um, there's quite a, a bit of information online. If you just look up, um, if you go to the food policy networks, um, dot org website and then go to our food policy resource database it's on the first page of the resources and it's at the bottom of the page and it's funding food policy councils stories from the field and you should be able to pull that up and find specific story of how the new mexico um, council got all of its funding and the next question um we have a little bit of information on our website as well the same website about this, but um, I guess I'll open up to the panelists they also want to discuss. So the question is, I don't hear many food policy councils talking about the TPP or the Trans-Pacific Partnership. What role can we play in this issue that would greatly impact our local work with school food, procurement policy, and many other areas that are both easily seen and more subtle? I'll take a little bit of a shot at that. Um, I think there's been the food policy councils still have a, a a longer way to go when it comes to engaging and even understanding some of the more complex issues, particularly you know when it comes to uh, trade agreements and so forth. Um, we've seen it to some extent with food policy councils trying to weigh in or grapple with. Um, you know, questions around GMO labeling. Um, I think my, my generally my best advice is that you have to, to some extent, you have to grow into these issues. You have to be able to have time to learn about them, you know, to seek out information about them, to educate yourself. Sometimes you can maybe find some experts in your area that will give you a briefing, but in, and that's also very helpful to become involved with national organizations that have the expertise on, on different topics. Trade, trade is one that I know IATP is uh, very closely aligned with, um, Center for Food Safety on GMOs. You know, these, these are, I just pick these issues because they tend to be ones that um, you know, food policy councils may confront but they're not quite sure what to do with them. And I think the main thing is that they they certainly need to understand how they will have an impact on their 
home um, communities. Um, I used the example earlier of uh, dietary guidelines. When we were looking at the dietary guideline recommendations, uh, we were trying to interpret them in terms of their potential impact on our community in Santa Fe. So we looked at agriculture, we looked at uh, lower income communities, we looked at some of the data around um, uh, obesity and so forth. And so we related those recommendations specifically to our community in order for them to make sense and for us to relate back to our elected officials. With some of these other bigger issues like that, to even, even global ones as well, um, I think that's going to be part of the challenge is you're going to have to figure out how to relate some of these really big macro uh, policy issues back to your own um, your own communities. And I will add that um, the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy did help uh, do a policy brief on the TPP and other trade agreements and how they might impact food policy councils. So if you go to our website, um, you can look that up. I think the document is in our resource database uh, listed as food sovereignty at stake in new trade deals. Um, and it's on the first page as well. So you can look that up a bit. Um, the next question is, um, I'm not sure, this might be a marked question. As most food policy councils have volunteer members and limited professional staff support, how did most of them successfully implement these long-term campaigns and projects? Well, two ways. One is that you you will have to eventually spend time trying to uh, raise funds to perhaps secure secure staff, even part-time staff. Um, you'll have to look at your own members uh, potentially to you know make a as much of a in-kind contribution of their time as possible. But I think the other way, some of the illustrations I provided were that you know you look to um, organizations that may be serving your state or region or even nationally for advice in terms of understanding um, you know understanding the topics, uh, the issues, how to respond to them or when the opportunities are right to respond and to weigh in. Um, and keep in mind that the response doesn't have to be, um, you know, the preparation of a 50-page document. You, know, you can simply write a letter saying that you are, you know, for or against or whatever your position is on an issue. Um, it doesn't have to be a long-term campaign. In other words, it can be uh, simply, you know, letting your elected officials know and uh, the appropriate administrative officials as well where you stand on an issue and why it's important to your community. Now, I, I stress this, that when a food policy council is meeting and they're taking action on something and they're looking at, say, what the change might be in the federal program, um, that it's always important for them to try to look for an opportunity to communi communicate their position on a subject back to their elected officials, even if it's just a short letter to the um, members of your congressional delegation, uh, letting them know that you're out there, number one, you're looking at these issues, and that you're, um, you, you have a point of view. What happens is that they then come back to you and will then be seeking you out for your opinion over time. So I don't think, you, you, you certainly can't exceed your capacity to uh, act on, on federal policy issues. But I think you can look for short, short-term, minimalist kinds of ways to express your opinion that aren't time-consuming or expensive. Thank you, Mark. Um, so we have about four minutes left. A few people have asked if we'll be sharing this presentation online. We will. We'll have a link to it um, on our website, and it'll also be sent out to you in a follow-up email as well as an accompanying resource that Mark briefly discussed that has more details than a lot of the examples that he gave in his presentation, as well as some specific how-tos, um, how to contact uh, your congressional representative, how to make a comment on a proposed federal uh, rule or regulation, um, and various other guides that might help you. Um, I will open it up for one more question, though, um, because I think this one could be helpful, and I think Kate Fitzgerald, this might be a good one for you. Um, is there a good 
efficient, streamlined way for food councils to follow and monitor related federal and state policies? Aha. Uh -huh. There isn't one easy answer to that question, but there, because it depends on which particular kinds of policies you're talking about. Um, that said, looking at the websites for the organizations that were listed, I think, on the penultimate, um, my penultimate slide, if you identify the kinds of issues, the category into which they would fall, the organizations listed there would be the places that I would suggest you go to monitor progress. And if you have any other specific questions, just follow up with me and I'd be glad to help if I can. Great. Thank you, Kate. Um, there are a few other questions, but if I don't think we have enough time before the webinar will cut us off. So if those questions are very dire, um, you can go ahead and reach out to me or to one of the panelists um, if you think it would be directed to them and we can follow up with you afterwards. So thank you again, everyone. And please remember to take our feedback survey and read the accompanying resource and we send it out to you later. Thanks.